Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In the section of the paralingual space, we have to consider the changes that occur due to edentialism. In the normal mandible, which we see here, in which the paralingual space has its full vertical height, we can demonstrate that best by realizing that the medial aspect of the mandible is traversed by a line, the mylohyoid line, dividing that aspect of the mandible into a submandibular space here and the paralingual space in this region. Notice here, too, the level of the genial tubercle. If we compare the full alveolar ridge with the edentulous situation, we can see that there are some changes that have occurred. The submandibular space that we studied earlier is basically similar. The mylohyoid line passes in this direction, and you will notice that there is an area in this region, which is, of course, our submandibular fossa. However, the area superior to the mylohyoid line is missing. The alveolar ridge has been resorbed. Now let's consider how that affects our specimen. Let's first compare the mid-sagittal plane of our two specimens. Here we have two heads, the face of one, the face of the other, and you'll notice the neck structures on this one on the right has been uh, removed. If we consider the landmarks of the mid-sagittal plane, we'll notice here the attachment of the muscles of the tongue to the genial tubercle. A similar situation exists over here in the edentulous mandible. However, notice that the genial tubercle in this case represents the highest part of the arch. Perhaps to best show that, we can draw a line on the intact ridge and show the level of resorption that has occurred in the edentulous mouth. It begins right at the genial tubercle and swings anteriorly in this fashion so that everything above this line all the way to this region has been resorbed to generate the edentulous situation. We'll next compare the paralingual spaces. Now let us consider the paralingual space in the edentulous situation. Here in the mid-sagittal plane, we have the tongue, of course, and what we need to do first is to reflect the tongue, and initially this space is going to be covered by mucosa. Now in those specimens in which teeth are present in the posterior arch, we need to make an incision along the ridge, which you can see the cut edge of that incision here, and it swings along this aspect here. That is the line from which we will begin our mucosal reflection. We'll remove the roof then of the paralingual space by reflecting the mucosa toward the tongue onto it and off. This will uncover the contents of the paralingual space. Let's review rather quickly then some of the salient features of the boundaries of this space. Here we can see that the first and major thing that you will run into is a large glandular mass, the sublingual gland mass. Associated with it is going to be a duct, and so we'll want to be very careful to maintain it and further associated with the duct is the lingual nerve, which is here. But these contents are relatively straightforward to locate. Here we can see beautifully the mylohyoid muscle as it swings from the mylohyoid line down into the depths of the paralingual space to the hyoid bone. Medially, and passing up on the medial aspect of the space is the hyoglossus muscle. Now that's a little harder to locate here, but these are fibers oriented in this direction, which will pass into the base of the tongue. Immediately above them, we find longitudinally oriented fibers in this direction, 
these are the fibers of the styloglossus muscle. Now, if we consider the very posterior extent of the paralingual space, which is shown very nicely here, we have, again, the area of the retromolar region, the appearance of the lingual nerve, and the lingual nerve is going to appear beneath the fibers of the superior pharyngeal constrictor as they come into the mandible here, and you'll notice that other fibers swing more medially and into the tongue in this region. You should be able to define then these posterior boundaries of the paralingual space. Now let's consider the edentulous uh, specimen. Here we have such an edentulous specimen. We've already considered these mid-sagittal points. Now I'd like to do the same thing, namely to reflect the tongue. However, when you remove the mucosa in this case, because the ridge is altogether missing, it's perhaps best to begin your reflection on the lateral aspect of the tongue. Here you can see that line at this point. We've cut the mucosa and then reflected it laterally to uncover and unroof the paralingual space. Now to give you an idea of the limitations of the space in the edentulus, I'd like to go over the boundaries of these muscles. I'm going to slide my contents out of the way. And here we have a beautiful example then of the paralingual space of an edentulous individual. Here is the ridge that remains of the alveolar bone. Laterally, we can see the extent of the buccinator muscle. And inferiorly, attaching right at the crest of the ridge are fibers of the mylohyoid muscle. So that you can see that the muscles that are lateral are nearly in continuity across the ridge with the mylohyoid. The depth of this space then is greatly limited. Posteriorly, we have many of the same boundary muscles. We can see here again the superior pharyngeal constrictor turning and coming laterally into the mandible and medially into the tongue mass and in this region, the area of styloglossus. And if you look carefully, we can demonstrate the lingual nerve. The gland mass here is the posterior, or rather the deep portion of the submandibular gland, and right here is the lingual nerve. So we can see that edentulism radically affects this particular dissection, and you should take care to make the necessary adaptions of your dissection technique to expose all of its contents. To further establish the relationships of the paralingual space, we'll now approach that space from the external approach. Here you have the base of the mandible, the digastric sling, and the space then of the submandibular region. We'll first reflect the superficial lobe of the submandibular gland, and then identify some of the muscular features of its floor, the mylohyoid muscle and the hyoglossus and the anterior belly of the digastric. We'll reflect this muscle, the anterior belly of digastric, from its mandibular attachment and reflect the mylohyoid from its hyoid attachment. The mylohyoid then is a muscular diaphragm separating the submandibular space from the paralingual space. We'll now reflect that muscle, and now you are actually looking into the paralingual space from the external view. In this view, we can identify some of the features of the paralingual space, the most obvious at this point being then the twelfth cranial nerve or the hypoglossal nerve as it approaches the paralingual space. You remember that that runs lateral to the hyoglossus muscle. At the posterior boundary of the, myel, or of the uh, hyoglossus muscle, we'll locate then the lingual artery. And to identify its branches, one needs to reflect 
the hyoglossus from the hyoid, and in doing so, we can expose then the branches of the lingual artery. Here is again the lingual artery, and you'll notice that there is a branch here, another branch which will pass forward into the major portion of the tongue at that point, and one which continues anteriorly and actually does lie in the paralingual space. It appears in the paralingual space at the anterior border of the hyoglossus, and that is the paralingual branch of the lingual artery. Now we've considered the entirety of the paralingual space. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.